we all asleep? <laughs> no? No? no. That's awesome. Um, I'm James. I've been doing this for a long time, right here. Um, I'm the uh, CEO and Managing Director of Red 8 Interactive. We're a custom development shop, national. We work with design agencies primarily in New York, LA, and San Francisco as their construction general contractors. Uh, we build sites based on their designs. Um, what I'm here to talk about quickly is one of my favorite plugins, which is Grabbing Forms. Um, and I'm going to also talk at the end about MailChimp. MailChimp is a email service provider, as probably 99% of you know. Grabbing Forms is a professional level form, form builder. And the two of them working together are the engine that could. Be. So I'm not going to get into how to use gravity force. I'm going to assume that most people have got some sort of sense for that. I'm actually writing a series of blog posts on our site right now about gravity forms starting at the most basic and going right up to the most advanced. But what I'm going to concentrate on today, since this is a lightning talk, is some tips and tricks. Some things that you may or may not know about, or may or may not have thought about, um, but we find very, very useful as we're developing uh, the more sophisticated and more complicated solutions that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the first thing, right down at the bottom, custom CSS class. How many of you are familiar with ready classes? Oh, well, good. So this is not a waste of time. <laughs> yes. Ready classes are awesome. Forms are horrible, right? Stack of crap. Sorry, technical term. Stack of stuff. <laughs> With the ready classes, you can rearrange things on, within the context of the form to make it more attractive and easier for your users to experience and, and supply the data that you're looking for. There's a whole bunch of them. There's a link in the presentation, which doesn't help you much, but it's, there's a whole bunch of them on the Gravity Forms documentation site. Um, and the way they work, they're very consistent. GF underscore left underscore half. That means that that field is going to appear on the left-hand half of the, of the form. Gravity forms left third. So here we've got this one is set at left third. This middle one is set at middle third. And the far one is set at right third. You find these under the appearance tab. When you're, when you're putting a, dragging a field into the form to work with it. They're also, you know, if you have a list of radio buttons or a list of checkboxes and it's like got 12 different things in it, and your, your client has said, look, I've got to have all this stuff, and it looks like a dog's breakfast on the screen. It's just a bit of a back. Gravity forms underscore list underscore three call. I've got 12 items in this list. Stacks them up, that's three columns of four. Just like that, easy, easy. Works great. Conditionals. How many are familiar? How many are familiar with conditionals as a concept? If then else. Okay. You can also use them in forms, and this is fantastic for things when your user appears on the screen and it's like, oh Lord, look at all that stuff they're asking me, and then they have to think about it and don't make me think, and they're gone. You can use conditionals to control what they see and when they see it. For example, this is taken from our um, onboarding form for the NAD product that we've developed. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Will there be a blog? No. OK, move on. Will there be a blog? Yes. OK. Will you accept comments on blog posts? There's no point distracting them with all that information if they're not going to have a blog. Right? That's where conditionals can be very helpful. 
Another place that conditionals can be very helpful, contact us forms. Wouldn't it be awesome to have that contact us form also send that name and email address to your email provider? But you want to make sure that it doesn't happen if they don't want it to. So you can use a conditional in gravity forms to control whether or not that data goes to your email provider. I'm setting myself up for what I'm going to be talking about in a second when I talk about the connection with email. But it's the same concept. Show if this field matches this. Of course, I can't read it, but. And that's very, very handy. Another really handy thing to make forms really interesting. Did you know you can put images into forms? It really makes for, lifts the whole thing up. And this is another one that we pulled from our innately onboarding form. One of the questions we asked, we give them nine <coughs> look and feels that they can choose from. And we've got a collage of pictures because people are very visual. You just say, I want a friendly look and feel. What does this friendly mean, really? So we use images. And the way you place those images in the label field in the gravity form control box, you can place HTML. So in this particular case, I've got friendly wrapped in an H3 tag. And then I've got a break. And then I've got the link to the image. Now, that may not be coders. I'm certainly not a coder, but I can handle this. And it really makes a difference for the form. We do the same thing with, with another question that we ask is, which color palette would you like? And we give them nine choices for color palettes. And we have an actual little swatch with the major color and the secondary color and the accent color. And it's all laid out there so they can see it visually. So they know what it is that they're picking. Lots of things in gravity forms that make the creating of the form a lot friendlier. The HTML block is your friend. It's a great way to, to insert some information into the form if you're trying to explain something to someone. You know, it just why am I asking this? Right? That increases the conversion you're likely to get from the film from the form if you can just provide them with a little bit of guidance. Your contact information, and in AP on order, we use this information to contact you. We will never share this information. It just reassures them that that's just done with a very simple little HTML block. Very, very handy. And you can still use, you can, under the appearance, you still have that custom CSS tag. So you can position these on the page if you wish. Another one that you've probably seen in gravity forms, but never quite knew what to do with, section. Now, a section block in gravity forms is obviously separates a section. It can be as simple as a long, right? But you can also put content into it. We often, for, for our commercial clients, will use the section block to insert terms and conditions. And one of the gravity forms style controllers is to put a scroller on it. So the terms and conditions can be this long, but it only appears like that. Lots of things you can do that are really, really handy. So, any questions? Does, that, does anybody have any questions that just bug the crap out of them about gravity forms? How many applications you can have in the gravity forms? How many forms can you have? How many applications? As many as you want to be managing. Many as you want to be managing. And it, actually, that's a great segue to what I'm going to talk about with Melchior. Any other questions sort of gravity form related? Form UX related? Okay. So, Mail Gravity Forms is a professional level form builder for WordPress. MailChimp is kind of an entry level email service provider. Still very powerful. 
kids do can do an awful lot of things and it's very easy to work with. Um, so generally for our innately customers, um, innately is a, a product we've been developing for the last four years which is going into the subscription website market. We're going at it a little bit differently. Um, but it's, uh, it, so it's for small businesses, micro businesses. And for them, MailChimp is awesome, it's perfect. It's got all the power that they need. So, step one, inside of Gravity Forms, you go to the add-on. As part of your premium license for Gravity Forms, you get lots of free things. You want to use them. MailChimp add-on is one of those. <coughs> So you go into add-ons, you find MailChimp, it's all stacked alphabetically, so it's about two-thirds of the way down. You select it and activate it, and it just operates like a plugin. It downloads like a plugin and says that you want to activate this, and you can still you can see it in the plugin library. It functions as you would expect. When you're connecting to an email service provider, and I'm using MailChimp in this example, but they all do this. Aweber, uh, Constant Contact, Active Campaign, Drip, and they all do this, at this conceptually the same way. There's two levels of contact. The first level of contact is this website and this install of Gravity Forms needs to be connected to MailChimp. And that's what we're doing here. It's within Forms, Settings, and then when you go in there, you'll see that you have an option to choose MailChimp. And you're going to want to put the MailChimp API key in that slot. Now you can get to the MailChimp API key by using. Oops. I don't need you to get fancy. You can get to them by using this handy link, or if you're already logged into MailChimp, you can just go to the pop directory over to MailChimp. Either way, it gets you over there. Once you're in MailChimp, you go to your, we have a MailChimp agency account, so we've got dozens of customers connected to our account. This is one of our the sites we're working on right now. Um, you go into the account setting in the upper right hand corner, you open up that drop down, you select account, and within account, you go to extras, API key. And yes, I know, it's not terribly intuitive. I didn't write this off. Um, you go into API key, and that's where you'll see it. If there's already one there, it will be displayed. Chances are it won't be there. So you press the button that says create a key, and it will go about creating the key. And then the API key, you can see labeled there. You're going to want to go in there and copy that key. Jump back to your WordPress install, place the key where it's asking for it, and hit update. And then MailChimp settings are updated and you get a nice green check mark at the end saying, oh, we are connected. We are talking to each other. The next level is at an individual form level. You can connect over to MailChimp. And this is where your question was great because you want to create different forms for different things, particularly if you're driving email activity off of the site. So you don't want to use the same contact us form everywhere. And I'll explain why in just a second. Who's this? This is a nerdy crowd. Highlander. Highlander. And what's the deal with Highlander? There can only be one. There can only be one. Right? MailChimp uses what I've affectionately referred to as the Highlander strategy to list management. MailChimp wants you to only have one list. They're structured that way, that's what they're striving for. And there's good reason for it. It's actually they're doing this on your behalf. MailChimp charges by the number of records you've got in their database. If you've got multiple lists, chances are you have duplicate records. And if you have duplicate records, you're going to have to pay for duplicate records once you get past their 2,000 threshold. If you just have one list, it eliminates the duplicates. 
but how do you manage different people coming from different forms if you only have one list? MailChimp uses groups to separate out different people in the list. An individual record can be in more than one group. If you've got groups from this, this group came from an event, they might be uploaded through a spreadsheet. You must make sure that in the spreadsheet that you created, you put a column for that group. And then that group matches up into the Belgian database. So you can find the groups under Managed Contacts Groups. And we're going to create a group. A very common group is Source. If you've got multiple forms on a, each one of those forms can have its own group. This is, a, a, this is for that site, Starby, which is going to be launching an app soon. So they've got a pre-launch under construction landing page where they're gathering email. So we're putting all the people who come in from that form into the pre-launch group. You need to create your groups in MailChimp first. Once you've created the groups in MailChimp, you can go back and assign a form and connect a form to MailChimp. So we've we pulled up a form. We've gone to settings. We're in forms. We go in settings and go MailChimp. It's going to say create a feed. Okay, well, that's what I'm going to do. I've got two choices. I can add a new or create one. It does the same thing. You select your one list from the list, and then what happens is the API reaches out to that list and says, okay, what's there? Right now the screen is blank, but after you've selected that list, it fills in with all the data that exists in the list. Back here to notice, groups. Source is the collection of groups, and the specific group is pre-launch. So this means any folks who sign up for the email via this form are going to be placed in the pre-launch group. Therefore, you can look for them later, you can use them in analysis, you can use them for targeting, if you're doing automations, lots of ways you can use groups. But that's how you connect them together. That's it. It's pretty simple. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah? It's kind of more of an answer question, but if you have um, somebody who's already on your master list, uh -huh. but you want to have a form on your website that will trigger a new automation in action for them, mm -hmm. they're always subscribed. Right. Is there a way of, if they go to a group or something like that, if you're on your master list, but it added to a group or something that would then trigger so an action? You, if you can do it manually, if you know who it is, if it's like in one off. Well, it might make it automated. Thing. If it's an automated thing, now if it's so with tags or anything, you know. Tags is something that Mailchimp is just introducing. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's sort of a. It's a lot like Gutenberg. Tags in Mailchimp is a problem a solution looking for a problem. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, so they're still developing it. But I'm not aware of any way to do that other than either manually or you can export your list, your master list into a spreadsheet, you can add columns in that spreadsheet and then re-import it into Yeah, it's been happy instant. So, so I, I think well, you merge tags are what you're looking for. If you click the checkbox that says update records, then it won't do it. It won't do it. It'll just add the data to the record. So they would sort of like add? Yeah. Okay. I do this all the time with customers. We'll go in and... Well, you're still talking about the spreadsheet. Yes. Yeah, we're talking about like real life time, like when they fill out No, I understood what you were asking and I'm not aware of a way to do that dynamically. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, no, uh, it's about the MailChimp lists. Uh, now you said they cannot push you to have one list. Uh, they're recommending it, yeah. They're recommending it, but what do you recommend if you're having multiple, if you're managing multiple clients? Yes. Well, that's where the agency, MailChimp has an agency account. Mm -hmm. 
like we have an agency account with MailChimp and that allows you to access your clients' MailChimp accounts directly. Do they charge for that? I don't believe so. No? No. Okay. It's pretty awesome, actually. Another really awesome thing, same concept. How many did you know about this? You knew that Stripe does the same thing. Where we've probably got 12 or 15 Stripe accounts connected to our master account. We can go in and manage API keys and do lots of things with customers. Yeah? You can manage multiple customers with the agency account, but their maximum allowable members number is something like you said 2,000 right before you. Well, before it starts to become a paid account. Yeah, yeah. And that's what, like you were saying. I that's where I got trapped last time was that I thought that it was a free service until we had like five, six thousand, and then you know it starts. No, to like it's two thousand. But, but I mean, at what point do you end up paying? What do you know? It's two thousand for one master list or per client. Per client. So uh, each client gets two thousand. Yeah, because to charge the client, them. the way they've got it set up, your client has to have the account, and your client puts in the credit card. Mm -hmm. Campaign Monitor does it differently. Campaign Monitor also has a master, uh, an agency account. The Campaign Monitor lets you control, have the fiduciary relationship with your client, and pass it through to Campaign Monitor. It's just two different ways of doing the same thing, but but it's only free up to two thousand people. Right? With with Mailchimp, I forget what the threshold is for Campaign Monitor, but um, they they have they all are, they're all pretty much the same. Minor differences, but. And that's 2,000 is quite a few for a lot of these small businesses. And email marketing is generates a really, really good ROI. So is, I don't usually have a difficult time convincing people that this is a worthwhile investment when we start showing them the results. Mm -hmm. And marketing automations are very, very powerful. Yeah? So can Gravity Forms do anything with the contact information that it is picked? you know, after it, MailChimp has received it. Does it do anything else with it? Or is it, it just- It stores it. So it's like, you know, handy little database. But yeah, if you go into, um, uh, I don't know if I've got a screenshot that shows this entries, edit settings, entries. If you go into entries, you can see all of the, all of the records. Mm -hmm. How many people have built directory sites? Oh, that's true. There's a, 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 a premium plugin called Gravity View, which is an add-on to Gravity Forms, which turns your Gravity Form functionality into a directory site. It's pretty awesome. Great questions. Any other, any other questions? What's the bug Yeah? I'm just curious about um, how much demand you see for people integrating with MailChimp versus wanting like a full CRM. Like, do you see people, you know, trying to go with Melchior because they think they want it and then kind of running out of rope and needing, needing something more advanced, or do you see people demanding, like, what's, yeah? That, that's a great question. Um, and I have this conversation with people probably three or four times a week. Not necessarily specifically about Mailchimp, but just in general. It's what I call killing house flies with a house syndrome. <laughs> lots and lots of people sign up for this stuff and it's expensive and it's powerful and it's awesome they don't need it yeah yagni right you ain't gonna need it and and email service providers is another one of those areas mailchimp does an awful lot of things it does it really well it has a pretty nice ui and it's not terribly expensive um, I'm familiar with the higher end platforms as well. We, with our large commercial sites, we work with Marketo, we work with HubSpot, we work with Salesforce, Cardo, Eloqua, you name it, we work with it. Um, and they, they are really powerful. And you've got a staff of three to run your Marketo set system here, it's great. If you don't have a staff of three, don't pay for Marketo. Okay. All right, thanks, James. You're great.